Okay, so hello my friends, and welcome to this second tutorial, uh, which today I want to cover uh, the very basic uh, method of putting together a sequence. Um, there are obviously a hundred different ways to put together a sequence. Uh, what I want to cover today is the very basic one, uh, which is predominantly a fixed camera, so the frame will be pretty much fixed on a particular uh, scene. Um, and other than switching uh, focal lengths on that same scene. Um, and then the action will happen on that, in that scene, entering and exiting. Um, there might be an additional shot uh, that I might add to it, which might include some panning. But basically, um, this is uh, a sequence that is going to be made up of um, uh, fixed shots um, that will, you'll be able to cut together to make a very simple sequence. Uh, simple, I should say, but effective sequence. There are lots of different ways that you can um, make up a sequence, including reveal type shots, panning shots, uh, pull focus, push focus, uh, zooming in, zooming out, all kinds of different ways uh, that you can add to any particular sequence. Uh, but this one is going to be the very basic um, uh, set camera on a set frame uh, with basic cuts. Okay, so that being said, um, uh, how to introduce this? Okay, so as photographers, wildlife photographers, uh, we tend to um, create images, go out at specific times of day to capture the best light, and we uh, enjoy capturing beautiful moments, um, which may or may not tell a story. Uh, they may just be uh, a beautiful portrait, wildlife portrait, um, which in itself can tell a story, actually. But they are very limited in the scope of the story that they're telling. So, for example, here, the story that I'm going to be working on today is about the white stalks that we have in the villages in the area here that I live in, uh, in North Greece. 
So um, here's a, a picture that I took yesterday morning uh, when I first came out to try and uh, put this video together. Um, and it's a, a photo of the male stork coming into land on the nest uh, carrying uh, sticks, um, nesting material. So that photo uh, in itself tells a story of the stork bringing sticks to the nest. Uh, but that's all it tells. Uh, it doesn't tell the whole surrounding story um, of how it forages for the sticks in the fields, of the relationship it has with its mate, uh, the bonding, the courtship, the mating, uh, the building of the nest. It doesn't tell any of that. It implies it, but it doesn't actually tell it. And in wildlife filmmaking, we have the opportunity to actually tell the whole story and show it. Uh, so that's what uh, this video is going to be all about, teaching you how to put together a sequence uh, of clips that will tell a more complete story. In wildlife filmmaking, um, in, in my opinion, I think there is basically one overarching story that is ever told, and that is one of survival. Um, you can, like today with the stalks, the, the nesting, the mating, uh, if you have raising of the young, feeding of the young, uh, hunting, grazing, regardless of the animal that you're filming, uh, regardless of the, the scenario, uh, it all comes down to survival when it's uh, wildlife. But each of those individual pieces uh, can be little stories um, in and of themselves, uh, which are nice to tell. And that's what I'm going to try and do here with the stalks. Okay, so the story I want to illustrate how to put a sequence together with uh, is uh, about these white stalks that we have uh, here in the, or in the villages in this area. And basically, um, they are mostly freshly arrived uh, in the last 10 days from Africa, so they're quite tired. Um, they find their mates. They usually return to the same nest year after year and um, uh, meet again with their mates um, and renew their bonds. Um, so there's a lot of uh, courtship, um, the nest building that happens, so they're all trying to put, together, put their nest back together or maintain them uh, because they've been obviously exposed all winter. Um, and all the nests are on these telegraph poles around the villages here. So it's a nice little story and it's a fairly simple um, one to be able to tell. Okay, so when you have a story in mind, like I do now for these stalks, um, it's useful to create in your mind a storyboard of how you want to put the story together. Um, and that will create for you uh, a series of uh, shots that you want to get. So you have uh, just by imagining the story, you have your. Uh, it will give you a shot list, and uh, if you write those down, uh, and then you can tick them off as you get them, then you know uh, when you've when you've completely um, captured the story that y it is that you're trying to tell. So a shot list for this particular instance with the stalks might be something as an opening uh, shot which sets the scene. Uh, so here I have the, the stork's nest on the telegraph pole um, with the church, a Greek church behind, and behind that in the far distance the mountains of northern Greece. So that instantly sets the place uh, and I'll do a wide shot of that to try and uh, uh, capture the whole scene. Um, my second shot would be of the birds on the nest um, just interacting with, with each other. Uh, a third shot on my list would be the male leaving the nest, flying off it, uh, heading into a field to forage for sticks or food. Um, the next shot would be him returning. Um, if I'm lucky uh, and I find a stalk in the right kind of situation, I might try and get a shot of him actually doing the foraging. So there might be a cutaway there. Um, where was I? So yeah, flying back to the nest with whatever he has, uh, either sticks or food. Uh, and then um, them bonding, uh, their greeting, where they um, 
clap their bills and um, uh, mimic each other. Um, uh, the mating ritual uh, and their close bond, basically. Uh, and then the closing scene would be something romantic of them being nuzzling each other, perhaps on the nest, uh, in beautiful uh, evening light. Something, something along the, those lines. So that would be my shot list. And with that in hand, I can then come out into the field and try and capture each one of those shots. For each of the shots uh, in your shot list, um, you'll want to get um, a variety of frames. What do I mean by that? So this is where a zoom lens such as this one here, the Sigma 60-600, to comes in so useful for video work because uh, you need to be able to zoom in and out. It's not possible uh, to really to be running backwards and forwards uh, with a fixed focal length to try and get the framing that you want. So for each of the shots, so scene, the, for example, my opening shot, the scene setting shot, uh, you need to get a wide shot, uh, a mid shot, and a narrow shot, close up shot. And that's true for all of the shots. Um, when the bird flies off the nest, when they're mating, uh, all of them. And the reason for that is that you want to be able to cut between them um, and make smooth cuts uh, between them uh, which are not jarring to the eye. Uh, and that way um, you will be able to hold viewers' attention better than just by having one clip that just runs for two minutes long. Um, you need to be able to cut every four, five, six seconds. Um, occasionally you might have a slightly longer clip, so usually the mating shot might be, uh, might run for longer, but even then you, 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 you would want to ideally cut into it uh, and change angle. And that way, so noisy here, sorry. I'm right next to the main road, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, you want to be able to cut uh, into any shot, uh, and the cuts are what keep people's attention. Um, like I said, if you have just one long clip, uh, people will soon get bored and turn off. I came down yesterday morning uh, with the idea of putting this uh, video together because the previous day um, we'd had a, quite a big storm, um, hugely windy, uh, and up high up on the mountain it had snowed, uh, so I thought it would make a nice backdrop for this. Um, so I came out yesterday morning to shoot it. Unfortunately, the wind was still about, so it was really uncomfortable, uh, both shooting the actual uh, footage I wanted, but also uh, trying to do this piece to camera. But uh, I will try and uh, put together whatever I did, uh, manage to shoot uh, into, a, into an introductory sequence, um, uh, and show it to you hopefully at the beginning of this video. Uh, so hopefully you'll have seen it already uh, if I was able to do that. Um, and then we'll work together now on the sh getting the shots that we'll put together in the final sequence. So the mail arrived completely out of the blue, caught me by surprise. I'm not sure if I... Oh, and they're mating. So let that run for a second. Again, rack in, closer. Okay, so hopefully I managed to capture that. As you can tell, I was trying to get the three shots of the same action, which, is, which was them mating. Um, he caught me by surprise when he arrived, so I'm not sure if I got him from outside of the frame coming in. Uh, or part way through the frame. Uh, so I might need to crop that um, to show him coming into the shot. Uh, so let me stop that recording now. And again, I'll just keep um, recording at different focal lengths, uh, wide, mid, and close up, uh, the action on the nest, um, and then waiting for him to fly off the nest. So now they're just uh, grooming themselves. And again, 
go wide, carry on shooting. So it's basically a continual uh, combination of wide, mid and close, trying to get a variety of shots of whatever they're up to so that then in the edit suite I can cut them all together. So now all I need to do is having got a bunch of those shots uh, is wait for him to leave the nest again and get that shot of him exiting frame. Okay, back out wide again. And carry on shooting. Ooh. And he flew off again. Don't know if you'll pick him up. See him flying through the frame? Maybe not. So he's flown off into the field behind. So I can stop that. And hopefully he'll return in a second or in a few seconds with uh, some more nesting material. Uh, hopefully he won't take forever to come back like he did yesterday uh, so I can I can get keep getting more shots to enrich the uh, edit. Okay so the male has yet to make a reappearance. Uh, I'm scanning constantly the area around me uh, in case he should come back from a different direction that he left in. Um, and in the meantime, what I've been doing is getting shots of the female uh, waiting on the nest. She's uh, grooming herself, uh, she's tidying up the nest. Um, so those can make uh, interesting fill shots, if you like, between the, the cut where he leaves the nest to go foraging uh, to when he returns. And, and again, I'm doing uh, wide, mid and close shots to give myself a variety uh, from which I can make the cuts from. Okay, so the male just flew back, thankfully, and I managed to see him in time, I think, uh, start recording and I hopefully, fingers crossed, captured him flying into frame and onto the nest. Um, they did, a, I think they did just did a brief uh, greeting. Um, they didn't do, uh, they didn't mate. Uh, and now the male is just stood over the female resting. So I'm hoping now that uh, there's uh, a little bit of action on the nest, hopefully. Um, and maybe I'll get him flying off the nest, uh, which will complete um, my shot list uh, for the shots I need to put the sequence together, with the exception of him foraging in the field. Okay, so the female just stood up and they're both preening. I'm zoomed, zoomed in quite close for this shot. I'll pause it and then zoom out again, reframe, carry on shooting. So most of these, in fact all of these uh, clips, I'm shooting at 50 frames per second. Uh, which slows it down enough to add a little bit of uh, romance and also um, lets you see the action that just that little bit better, especially the flying. Oh, and they're mating again. I, I'm wide now and then I stop, go in slightly closer, reframe and carry on shooting and he's jumped off her now. So I can stop that clip, go back out wide again, carry on filming. So that will allow me to cut between those and hopefully make it slightly more interesting. So what was I saying? Yeah, I'm shooting all of these at 50 frames per second, which slows the action down just that little bit. And each clip um, I'm doing anything from 10 to 30 seconds, depending on what's happening in the shot. Um, and that should give me enough time uh, in the edit suite uh, to be able to cut to the action that I, I'm after showing um, in those particular clips. Okay, so that's a good mix of shots I've been able to get. Um, like I said, the only shot that's missing, or two shots that are missing in fact, are um, him 
flying off the nest uh, to go forage so that I can actually cut that into before uh, the sequence that when I miss that shot and then um, him actually foraging in a field somewhere uh, for food or sticks or what have you. I think when he flew in, I'm not sure if he was carrying any anything in his beak. So he might have just been away um, looking for food. I'll have to replay that. Uh, when, if he flies off again, then I'll get that shot. Uh, and then I'll try and find the, the clip where he flew in to check and see if uh, he's actually uh, carrying anything in his bill. So the male is uh, stood up and preening himself. And I'm feeling he might go at any moment, judging by his movements. But I also remembered something else that I uh, had been meaning to mention, which is uh, in for the sake of continuity as well, um, what really helps is if the bird uh, exits the frame in if if the bird and exits the frame in a particular direction that it re-enters from the same direction um, that also helps with the continent continuity of viewing uh, for, for the viewer uh, it's a bit jarring if you have something exit on the one side and then re-enter from a different direction um, obviously it's not always possible to uh, predict there's some ways uh, that you can get around that. For example, flipping the shot, um, which is not always possible. So for my example here, it's not really possible because I have the church and the mountain in the back. And it would be obvious if I flipped the shot uh, that uh, something is not quite right uh, from one shot to the next. So um, yeah, that's why it's, it's also important. And he's gone and I'm recording, thankfully. Okay, and he's just flying across. I don't know if this camera will pick it up. Okay, he's headed off. Hopefully into the next field. Okay, so thankfully I had the camera running um, because I suspected he was going to make a move. Uh, and he did. So now I have pretty much all the shots except for him in the field uh, foraging. I'm just going to have a look and see when he came back to the nest last time if he actually brought anything with him. Uh, and then I shall try and get that shot of him in the field um, either now um, because I'm pretty much finished at the nest or, or I'll do it on another afternoon and make it up, uh, make it, cut it into the video um, before I upload it. So hopefully uh, this has been of some use to you um, and I hope you've enjoyed watching. Uh, stay tuned to the end so you can see the final sequence uh, cut together. Uh, I am no expert by any means in editing um, but I do my best especially with the color balancing and color matching from one shot to the next that I find really difficult um, but hopefully uh, I'll get to that uh, as a tutorial in a future video at some point as well how I go about it. Like I said, I'm no expert, but uh, I, do, I, I, I can do a, a fair job, I think. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it, and I shall see you in the next one. Bye for now.
Okay, so whilst I'm waiting for some action to happen here with the, with the stalks, um, I thought I would answer a question um, that was asked on last, the last video on frame rates, uh, which was from Andrew from Canada. And he was basically asking, how does this apply practically to how do you set it in your uh, DSLR, the frame rates, etc. So I'm happy to um, go through that. I, I'll, I'll show you on my um, Canon 5D Mark IV, uh, but the same principle will be true for all, all your cameras, regardless of um, um, make. Um, it'll just be a different uh, place on the menu. Um, the first thing you need to do is switch your camera uh, into video mode and that should open up some video-centric uh, options on the menu. The second step is to choose the system for the geographic region that you're in. So if you're in the Americas uh, and Japan, um, then you need to be using an NTSC system. And if you're in Europe or rest of the world, uh, you need to be using PAL system. Uh, so if you find where on your menus you can choose either of those, choose the appropriate one. And then that in itself will open up uh, the option somewhere else in your menus uh, where you can choose the movie recording quality. And uh, that will be in the multiples uh, for your geographic region. So if you're in the US, it'll be 30, 60, 120. If you're in Europe, it'll be 25, 50, 100. Um, and then you just choose that. Usually you get a choice of file types as well that you can select from uh, all I or IPB. Um, I tend to choose all I uh, as there's less compression in those. Uh, so it's a higher quality um, file. Uh, I think that's the only options that you get. Um, but have a look uh, and um, make the selections that you want. And then obviously you need to set the frame rate uh, accordingly. So I'll explain in more depth on my 5D Mark IV in a second, um, and hopefully you can take that principle and, and um, uh, investigate on your particular camera. My Canon 5D Mark IV uh, DSLR, and the first thing we need to do is actually switch the camera into video mode, because that will open up um, a whole bunch of different options on our menu. And the way we do that on the 5D Mark IV is by this switch here, just uh, turning it from stills to video. Uh, as you'll see, live view is then um, enabled, and then we can hit our menu button and access our uh, video menu. Now, the first thing you need to do um, is set the right uh, format for the region that you are in. Um, in Europe, we use uh, PAL and most of the world uh, in places like Australia and New Zealand, etc. And in the Americas, North America and most of South America, as well as I think Japan, um, they use NTSC. And the way we access that is through the spanner icon just there. And I think it's menu, submenu item number three. Yeah, it's the first item, submenu number three under the spanner icon. Um, and here we can choose either for NTSC or for PAL. And choosing either of those options uh, will then uh, open up the options for the frame rates according to your region. So for NTSC, we'll give you multiples of 30. So you'll shoot 30, 60, 120 frames per second. And if you select PAL, it'll give you the 25 frame per second multiples, 25, 50, 100, etc. So seeing as we're in Europe, we'll hit PAL for the moment. Um, if you then navigate back to the camera icon, um, and then I think it's submenu 3, 104, oops, submenu 3, no, 4. So submenu 4 underneath the camera icon. Um, you are presented with a, a, an item which says movie rec quality. And if we select that, um, we are given several choices here. 
Um, this is the, at the top it displays what is currently set. Um, the first item that we can select is choosing the type of file that we want, whether an MOV or an MP4 file. Um, I think MOV is a higher quality than MP4 and is definitely easier to use on Mac, which is what I'm on. Um, the second choice down is movie rec size. So if we select that, uh, we're given five choices. Um, the first is 4K 25p and it produces an MPEG file. Uh, the second is FHD, full high definition 50p or lie. Then full high definition 50p IPB, FHD 25 frames per second or I, FHD 25 frames per second IPB. Um, I think you can pretty much ignore the IPB options as they are a lower quality video um, with more compression, um, unless um, memory card space is an issue, I guess. Um, so that leaves you with three options uh, 25p FHD or I. 50p all I FHD and 25p 4K as an MPEG file. Um, if we go back, those are the main options that are given to us um, on the Canon. Um, sorry about that, let me just turn that back on. Um, we also have uh, a, an option for 24p, uh, 24 frames per second, which I have disabled at the moment. And we also have an option for higher frame rate, which I also have disabled. The reason I have it disabled is if we select that, um, it basically, if we enable it, um, it only gives us the option of a 720p file at 100 frames per second, which is too low a quality for what I need personally. But uh, then again, for most uh, internet use, it should be fine if you want to go up to 100 frames per second. Um, you should enable that option. So let me just go back out of there. Uh, and that's basically it for setting your frame rates. The same is true if you had set NTSC. Uh, instead of the 25p, you'd see 30p and 60p option um, available to you. So um, in addition, what might be worth noting is that on the Canons, um, you have the option, let me just switch the live view off, you have the options at the top of the camera here on the main dial um, for custom functions, C1, C2, C3. And what I do is I preset, uh, pre-program these custom functions for video so that in the field if I want to set any particular frame rate um, I can do that just by turning the dial rather than faffing around through the menu and I have C1 set to 25p, C2 to 50p and C3 to 4k video and that should save you a lot of time and fiddling around with frame rates and shutter speeds if you have them pre-programmed into those custom functions.